Lemon Amiga present. You know that you can mean so much to me. A play giant video review. You know that you can be so much to me. Sit back and get in the show. Looking back, I see what I was meant to see. To another Lemon Amiga play guide and review. In this special Amiga 30 episode, we'll be checking out Cannon Fodder, developed by Sensible Software and released by Virgin Interactive in time for Christmas 1993. It begins with some cinematic music and some great introduction titles which introduces to the programmers and the makers of this game. Not least John Hare, Chris Yates and let's not forget Chris Chapman and Julian Jameson. This is Amiga 30 week so I'll be covering two games which are classic Amiga games. This week of course Cannon Fodder and the Cannon Fodder controversy surrounds the game even today and we'll be covering that a little later on. I'd just like to highlight the fact that this review was in no way connected to the Royal British Legion. Let's press the left mouse button and check this game out. When we begin, we are presented with all our lives marching across the screen, and two of those will be selected for our very first mission. We can also load and save from this point, and that's right, we can load a saved game, quite a number of those in fact, you can even scroll up and down. Let's start on level 1, and clicking on the background reveals an introduction screen. Given that mission brief, with just two soldiers, you must kill all enemy. Oh. Cannon fodder is a top-down, isometric, semi-open world shoot-em-up, and we use the mouse to control our soldiers. They are not armed at this point except for a couple of guns, and we'll have to use those to take down the enemy. By clicking on the map, we can find out the region that we're in, and at the moment it's just the one screen, and you can see the enemy as very dark green blobs, and they walk towards us, waiting to be killed. Special bonus for completing that very first mission, we are given a whole bunch of extra lives who will queue up waiting to be destroyed in this game. Let's take the next three competitors into action and check out mission two. In this game some of the missions are split into sections and this is the first part, phase one of two you can see, and the briefing as usual is to kill all enemy. Now the 
game world opens out and we find our first river. The rivers will slow us down, of course, and it will take time for the enemy or us to wade across those. And it's essential to make sure that all the guys on this level are clear, and that means investigating the river. By moving the mouse to the edge of the screen, we can simply move it along and look forward into battle. <laughs> Each level also comes with its own brand of stereo sound effects and in the jungle of course we get to hear that jungle which gets louder if we pause on the screen and the great sound effects of the people taking hits of course is unmistakable and is perhaps the loudest aspect in this game. I don't know about you, but I think this phase complete music is absolutely fantastic and is probably my favourite part of the game. When we actually get through a mission, we get a very nice congratulations music. Now things begin to get tough and all aspects of this game begin to reveal themselves and this game turns into a creep em up as we creep around the level trying to survive. Unfortunately those birds cannot be killed, no this is not duck shoot, what we need to shoot is the enemy and we'll get full credit for that. Every single enemy and every single enemy installation will have to be blown up on each level and again the game introduces the player to each level very gradually giving a nice pleasant learning curve. Unfortunately none of the enemies themselves appear on the map, we appear on the map as a large cross and sometimes the installations are clear to see in the bottom corner. Our guys will stick together like glue but in this game it is actually possible to split those off and we can send a guy in front or behind to take out enemies that we may have forgotten and we can set up traps and things like that. Unfortunately this is not Dune 2, it is quite difficult. One should split those guys off to coordinate a two pronged attack but as far as I know those guys will remain on guard behind so hopefully we can wander around and take out those enemies in safety. So let's just try to get to that place. No, those guns will not reach and you have to find the limits of that gun because when you're taking on enemies of course you will have to find the limit of their guns and take them on from the very edge. That means you should be relatively safe in this game at least at this stage. So by clicking on the icons, you can see icons have appeared. The green is our single soldier and the red eagle are the, the two platoon guys I'm using at the moment. By clicking on the guys themselves we can now swap between those and we can move one and move another and hopefully get those guys on the move at the same time. So a little bit like lemmings you have to control and coordinate and I guess we are the general in this game, coordinating our troops. Unfortunately, that water really does slow us down to a grind. And clicking on places where we can actually go in this game, sometimes the troops at this stage are pretty ignorant. Particularly with bends in rivers, line of sight becomes important and I'm going to use the two pronged attack hopefully to take care of the guys on the relative bank and running around on the opposite bank means that we should be able to take care of those. But when the squad comes back together it doesn't automatically link those guys back together into a squad and there are advantages and disadvantages to this, mainly if your guys get killed it means you can leave one behind to complete the level. If all your guys get killed on the level then that means you'll have to try it all over again, but as long as one survives it is possible. You may notice that we're storming our first base, we are collecting our first pickup and that's four hand grenades. 
the ball will appear on that instrument readout panel and by lobbing one of those into that bunker those guys are dead <laughs> The end of each set of stages which make up a mission will also be given the usual intermission screens will be shown who's died who's welcome and the next mission brief screen and you saw the helicopter crashed on this WHD load version but let's get on with mission three where we find our very first ice world and another base to blow up these boins can only be blown up with grenades and no amount of bullets will blow those up and sometimes guys will emerge you can see that door opening and closing and a number of guys will emerge from each one of those bases sometimes they respawn but mostly as soon as you've killed all the guys in the base that's it and so what you need to do is kill all the guys and then lob a grenade in there and if you lob a grenade in first of course that will deplete all the enemies inside that base See another guy has respawned. Sometimes enemies can wander around the landscape and track us down. And look at that. We can even dive off cliffs and survive, which is great. The icy water won't kill us either. And so let's move along these plateaus and try to stalk the relatively obvious guys on this level. It's difficult to see those in the jungle. Let's liberate those supplies. Holding down the right mouse button, we can activate anything that we've managed to pick up, and by clicking on that symbol in the inventory bar, we can activate it. At the moment, we only have 15 grenades, but 15 grenades is great because only one grenade is necessary to blow these up. And it's important to observe the roof flying off that thing. If that touches us, then we'll blow up, and because we are all in a straight line, that's game over. We'll have to recruit some more guys. So at this stage it's important to observe the height sometimes it's difficult to fire uphill unless you're actually on the same level but so i used a grenade just lob that over the wall and that's them out of the picture so it, it really is fast to progress in this game and the tactics involved to progress through each level safely is becoming evident already as we move through these levels so sometimes, as I say, it's a creep em up, but sometimes when you are on the same level, it's best just to press that fire button and fire wildly using the crosshair over your target. Unfortunately, some of our troops got killed in battle, and if they stay around for many levels, they will be upgraded through the ranks and become better. And you saw the names of the programmers on the roster being the first troops to go into battle, of course, the first to step into line. this level we must destroy all enemy buildings so it really doesn't matter how many of the enemy we kill as long as we destroy those buildings and hopefully we can see those on the map by moving around the screen it actually moves a lot quicker than games like June 2 and I think this mouse control on June 2 would have been absolutely fantastic but this level is called beachy head and you can see a beach there containing some enemies and it's a quite wide open map at this stage you have to find those buildings and destroy those and what i like to do is to avoid most of the enemies by going around a long way hopefully that will surprise them but i'm trying also to cut that distance down across the river 
while we are in the river, of course, we'll be absolutely vulnerable. And just like Ikari warriors, being vulnerable in a river with hordes of guys shooting at us isn't very opportune at the best of times. So let's grab the ammo before we get any further in this game and lob one grenade towards that building. It's a great satisfying effect whenever something blows up or gets shot and you saw there sometimes dead ends will lead to instant death and as you will see later on rocket launch guys and snipers and booby traps and pits of death perhaps in this game certainly blind alleyways where people can lie in wait so be careful of sending all your guys together like this sometimes you can be very gung-ho but if you let a guy wander into your squad they could blow most of those up and only one bullet in this game will take down one of your guys so very fairly one bullet kills them but also one bullet kills us and these guys are disposable of course that's why it's called cannon fodder and i've been known to complete a level with just one guy you see one guy got stuck on the scenery and just like Syndicate that we reviewed, the mechanics are pretty similar. You have to click around and hope that the guys find a path towards that target. And sometimes you have to lead those by the hand. See the isometric 3D graphics are well drawn and different colours, shades of grass and different shades of trees and it gives the illusion of this game being very nicely drawn because these graphics are very small on the screen and of course the graphics are taken inspirationally from games like Megalomania and Sensible Soccer where the graphics were meant to be drawn small and I guess it gives us a bigger screen range so that we can see ahead and just like micro machines perhaps so bigger sprites on this game would definitely have ruined it and you have to rush in and grab whatever it is that you need before you start blowing things up Occasionally, the game will also give us mini challenges, and in this challenge we have to defend ourselves, being surrounded of course by the enemy, and we have 8 grenades in which to take out that building, and as long as we take out this screen pretty smartly, then that should be the challenge over. to mission 4 phase 3 and now we have 5 guys in our little unit and we have no longer a scouting party this is more like a raiding party or even maybe a small platoon let's line those guys up in front of that enemy and let's blow those guys all away I think it's great that the sense of humour of the programmers always comes through and even that burning cauldron in sight of all these mud huts and yes we can blow the ones with doors up and hopefully that should take out those enemies 
but this game has a great sense of humour. It also has a thoughtful side. You have to plan your attacks, you can't just wade in at this point, and it's easy for all these guys to get blown up. So just one stray bullet could be the end of us. And you can see a hole on the floor. Yes, that's actually an enemy bunker. And as far as I know, you have to still throw a grenade into that to stop those guys respawning. Just like all those great action films you saw, including Platoon. Let's blow those up, and hopefully that should be the end of it. I think it's great that the sounds of war are mixed in with the sounds of the jungle or the environment and I certainly think that this game reminds me of all those great war movies and the helicopters particularly Good Morning Vietnam and all those great films of the 80s and perhaps even Sylvester Stallone's Rambo 2 but in this game, you don't just carry one gung-ho hero around, you have to carry five in this level. And we are being incredibly lucky that nobody's been shot so far. Of course, if you split those guys up, then the ammo will be split up as well. And that comes in handy. Again, sometimes it's best to run like crazy. But you saw one of our guys died running like crazy, so we only have four guys remaining. And that's certainly no hardship. Let's continue and brave on this level. And you don't want to be sinking into those pits because if you wade in too far, those are quicksand, you'll probably not get out. It may surprise you to learn that there are actually 72 levels in this game, and the game came in three discs. And some of the magazine reviewers complained that this wasn't HD installable, but to my mind, three discs isn't too bad. And of course, 72 levels is enough for anybody. And you can't save until you've completed a level, which makes perfect sense. And once again, it's great to see those guys jumping up in joy when you've completed a level, and that's the sense of humour again pouring out of this game. There are tanks in this game later on and vehicles that we can climb into and wreak havoc on this landscape but you may have noticed the name of this level is quicksand and at this point the game introduces the player to yet another feature unfortunately not the quicksand no we have landmines to deal with and if you trip over those just like platoon then you are unfortunately going to die <laughs> Having recently seen Arnie, programmed by Chris Butler for the Commodore 64, I guess you could say this game is more or less a conversion of Lemmings, Arnie, Commando and Dune 2 all wrapped into one. And this kind of environment hasn't really been done since, and apart from the sequel that is, and that will be seen a little later on. But for now, let's try to guide our men around in safety and we cannot fire while we are bogged down, either in water or in literally a bog. So we are highly vulnerable and look at these bushes. Sometimes you have to use those for cover and let the enemy run out because it's very difficult to see those. Cannon fodder was developed by Sensible Software and they began on the Amiga apparently according to the Lemon Amiga website as part of the Shoot 'em Up Construction Kit team and their official first release was Megalomania which appeared in 1991. They also created the Sensible Soccer and Sensible Soccer 1.1 games and WizKid appeared in 1992 before this. The code was created by Julian Jameson, known as Jules, and he began on the Amiga with Frostbite in 1988, the Frank Bruno-like Seconds Out in 1989, and he also helped on the team that created Beverly Hills Cop, unfortunately, in 1990, and then he helped with Sensible Software's Cannon Fodder, Cannon Fodder 2, and also Sensible Golf in 1995.
to help Jules with the code. There was also Chris Chapman, known as Chipper, and many people may remember First Division Manager, which appeared on the Amiga in 1992, which he coded. And also another co-coder, Chris Yates, of course, the original Sensible Team. John Hare and Chris Yates began on the Commodore 64, and Chris worked with Chris Chapman, of course, on Megalomania. These graphics were created by Stuart Cambridge, also known as Stu. His voyage on the Amiga began with games like Classic 4, Renaissance and The Final Conflict, which all appeared in 1990. And the music was also a two-man team, this time John Hare, known as Jops. If you wondered where Jops came from, John Hare began with Galaxy Birds on the C64 in 1986. Galaxy Birds, a crazy bird shoot em up in space, and he followed that with Parallax in 1986. And the team went on to Whizball, of course, in 1987, and none of the Whizball Sensible Soccer team actually got together and created the Whizball Amiga version. That's why Whizball on the Amiga is absolutely dire. And to help John with the music, the classic Richard Joseph, who many people may remember from our past reviews, Speedball 2, for example, the Chaos Engine, the James Pond games, and also he created Cadaver music, and also music for the 3D game Voodoo Nightmare. You can see we have no shortage of extra lives in this game at this point, but you saw all those crosses beginning to pile up, and those crosses will begin to pile up until they absolutely devour the hill like a forest before the end of this game. And it's great to see that cemetery building up, but I really don't think army recruits have to wander through a cemetery to sign up. If they did, they probably would not bother. But this was the first and the last thought-provoking game, which actually thought-provoked people into action. Yes, the British Legion actually got together and formed a petition against this game, and they had to withdraw the game and take the poppy from the cover, the original cover, and they had to insert the message at the beginning of the game, saying that this was absolutely nothing to do with the Royal British Legion. I think using the poppy symbol, and particularly the graveyard and the very sad music on the recruitment screen, gives enough pause for thought into army recruitment, and yes, it's also a joke, not that many people actually die in the army, thanks to body armour and tanks and things like that. In fact, militia are one of the few who don't die in the army, usually if you're flying around in something, and you're driving into action and laying bombs, then you tend to get killed, but the army themselves are generally safe. So this game is very gung-ho, and this wouldn't happen in real life, of course they'd simply dive-bomb these buildings and explode them remotely. But in those days, in the 1990s, of course this was almost real, and the movies at the time depicted this as army life, and with the poppies on top of all that, and the British Legion scandal, and everything which made this game notorious at the time, it is forever linked to the Amiga. Things are becoming taxing now as we gain rockets. We have to fire those long distance before those snipers hit us. Bazookas are a great weapon and they fire directly into the enemy, but in this level we have cliffs and elevation changes where grenades would be probably better. And look at this, we have to take on our first sniper right from the go, and that's why I already wiped out one guy. So hence splitting guys off and sneaking around, and hopefully if we can drop down and pick up some supplies, we have the grenades, we can simply lob those over the edge and take those guys out strategically. 
So this is a strategic game. It definitely requires a strategy and a pause for thought, especially when you get killed and you have to retry all over again. I remember at the time various magazine cover discs appeared with slight different games than this. Instead of giving away a demo, the sensible crew gave away games like Cannon Soccer and Soccer Fodder, which mix these games up. And if you've ever played a football game where the hand grenade football blows up after a certain time, then you'll get some idea of the humour of this game. I think the learning curve is absolutely perfect. It encourages the player with a ridiculously easy first level and keeps building on that with traps and unknown treasures. Just like Lemmings, it forces the player to think about their moves before they make them, having died already on these levels. And sometimes you can wander behind cover and they will blow themselves up. But sometimes they won't and you'll just waste a guy. So, whilst you see me persevering with this level, I'll just run through the scores. The lowest score I could find was Amiga Joker magazine, who gave this 85%. The Lemon Amiga crew weren't actually very far behind, with 88% currently on the Lemon Amiga website. Amiga Force gave Canon 90%, along with ACAR, and Amiga User International gave it 93%. The One gave it 93, Steve Amiga gave it 93, Amiga Action gave it 94%, Amiga Computing also gave it 94%, and Amiga Power gave this game 94% in December 1993. And the very highest scores I could find, Amiga Dream, which is a magazine I've never heard of, gave this 95%. And Amiga Down Under magazine, yes, there were even specific Amiga Australian magazines, they gave this 95%. And if you were waiting for Amiga formats, well, they gave this also 95%. They said that this was a very intelligent game, very thought provoking, and they only said the downside was no HD installation and things like that. But they gave this a massive thumbs up, having reviewed. Basically, Frontier Elite with 94%, they said this deserved one better because it's instantly playable, fast and fun. That gives Cannon Fodder an average rating of 9 out of 10. And I can certainly see where they found that rating from. It could have been slightly better in the fact that the enemies could have been on the map and that could have meant that we can plan our maneuvers, but going into the fog of war like this, and taking on these guys one by one, trying all different kinds of ways to kill those from close contact and from far away, that certainly adds to the game, and when we are out on our limb there, one guy wandering around, that certainly increases the tension and the heart rate as you're trying to keep this guy alive. I think Cannon Fodder is actually quite a tricky game and it was definitely tricky for me when I played this back in the day. I don't think I got halfway through the game before it got very tricky indeed. And you can see there the enemy blows us up before we get anywhere near him. Let's just have a quick action replay and listen to those sound effects. That's 
slow down by 50% it sounds like Hell's Waiting Room music. They released the game on many platforms including the Mac, and the SNES and the DOS but this game was so popular on the Amiga that the same team got together and created Canon 42. <laughs> Two was developed by Sensible Software and released by Virgin Interactive in 1994 and you can see Stuart Campbell there has made it from Amiga Power. He was heavily involved with the original Scandal developed with the Daily Star and apparently the Daily Star took Stuart Campbell's comments about cannon fodder and took them and turned them onto their heads until the Royal British Legion got involved. And Stuart Campbell backed up these claims by saying that Cannon Fodder was actually anti-war and I'm not sure this game is anti-war, it seems to take war on to an extra level. <laughs> yet another great introduction theme and uh, let's skip on let's press that left mash button and it wants disc 2 after you've inserted disc 2 that great introduction picture disappears and we find a very otherworldly landscape greeting us in this game Green reminded me of cheese and perhaps James Pong 3 and yes we can also load and save as normal but I'm just going to press that left mash button and check this out and that great introduction screen with the parallax scrolling and we are back here again in the same comfort zone only this time we are under attack from square one and the aiming of those guys have also taken an increase and so you won't find this game so much of a push off Forty Two was released on the Amiga and on the DOS platform in '94, and it might surprise you to learn that the actual original Canon for it was banned in Germany because they thought that the game was too violent. They had no problems with Canon Forty Two, and so mixed opinions there. But they said that this game was bloody and war. Uh, you can see hardly any blood on the screen, and it's great that we can literally blow those guys off their feet. And I don't know if you noticed in the other review, part one, we can actually blow those guys out of the water, send those flying across the landscape. So this is cartoon action rather than actual war, only the sounds of war sound pretty similar. <laughs> Instead of Vietnamese jungles we find Arabian desert and if you peer and squint your eyes you may even be able to see the head cloths on top of those Arabs and you can see the difficulty spike really does spike as we are under attack by an entire division before we get anywhere near that target and all we have to do once again is to blow that level up and everyone contend upon it. Now that we have four grenades sometimes it's possible to ration those away particularly when you only have one guy remaining but you can see the action is still packed and you still have to be careful to collect those things instead of blowing those things up and you still have to avoid booby traps and things like that <laughs> I 
I think the sensible team, plus Stuart Campbell after that fiasco, made a great Cannon Folly 2 game. And even if Stuart Campbell was only on side in spirit and didn't actually code and graphic this game, I think the PR involved with Cannon Folly series was an absolute PR heaven. So they did go on to create Cannon Folly 3 later in the evolution of this game, but most people only remember the original Cannon Fodder. Cannon Folly 2 actually got 79% on the Lemon Amiga database, and the one gave it 85, CU gave it 88, Amiga Power gave it 89, and Amiga Format gave this game 90%. Thank you for watching another Lemon Amiga play guide and review. <laughs>